Thank you for joining us at Journey Church. Our hope is that these messages challenge your soul, equip your spirit, and give you a hope for your future. For more information about our church, visit us at ourjourney.tv. Now, here is Pastor Vince Farrell. Well, we are, as a church, been focusing on this concept of Jesus in 3D. You know, 3D is designed to, when you look at something, it jumps off at, off the page, it jumps off at the movie, it's supposed to really give you a, a new experience. And what our hope is in 2019 is that Jesus will be a whole new experience to you this year. That as you read your Bible, it's not just reading about a historic event, but it's about reading the person of Jesus Christ. And secondly, our desire as the body of Christ, as the church, is to be Jesus in 3D. Now, over the last few weeks, we've kind of talked about having a new goal, a new way of thinking, setting, setting new uh, possibilities for our life. And that while there are a lot of self-help books, and there's nothing wrong with that, in looking in our desire to be real, Jesus in 3D, it means we have to push past the New Year excitement and really dive into making it our hope. Are you here this morning? See, anyone can get excited over the possibilities of a new year. Uh, this year I'm going to lose weight. This year I'm going to really work out. This year I'm going to quit that addiction. This year I'm going to say to her, will you marry me? This year I'm going to do some things. But it takes moving past the excitement into making it a God-felt hope. So can I ask you a question? Is hope driving you this year? Is hope driving 2019 for you in all that it can be? If not, I hope you'll look to Jesus for this new concept of living. And so we have been on a journey the last four weeks simply called 60 Months From Today. Say that with me. 60 Months From Today. Now, next week, we start a new series called 59 Months From Today. Because <laughs> of February and see, there's, okay. 60 Months From Today. In week one, I asked, who do you want to be? Because... If you're not living the life that God has called you to, then the best time to make that adjustment is now. It's not just looking at the next 12 months. And I shared with you some of my personal struggle, how I always set a goal to lose 50 pounds, and then I lose about 30, and then I find it again, and then I came up with friends, and they're having a party, and here I am heavier than when I first started. So I've set a new goal, to lose 50 pounds in 60 months. And I'm starting with baby steps. Because how many of you know this morning that time flies? It does, man. I, I had two friends of mine on Facebook from different youth groups post pictures of 10 and 15 years ago. Boy, if that doesn't make you feel old. But time flies. It just seemed like yesterday. And so, so five years from now, I don't want you to be stuck where you're at in your spiritual journey. In week two, we looked at how to handle the middle part. Because the, like I said, the beginning is exciting. The end we know is the goal. But it's the middle part that's hard. It's the middle part of change that's difficult. If I could say it this way, it's the after the honeymoon Y'all know how it is. Oh, I love you, honey. I love you, too. Month three, get off my side. <laughs> now, it gets hard, and, and, and we must be people so committed to Jesus that we're willing to go the distance. Amen? Amen. Let me just expand your, your vision. 60 months is only five years. I mean, think of the next 25 years. If I could just interject under the leading of the Holy Spirit, 
what type of marriage will you have? Will you have the type of marriage that in 30 years from now, your testimony will be, you know what? It was hard. It was difficult putting up with that person. It was miserable at times. It was so discouraging. We went through dark seasons of our marriage. But I'm pleased to say we're getting ready to celebrate our 40th year of marriage. Because we decided to go the distance. Will that be your testimony? Or will your testimony be, yeah, I'm on my second marriage. Now here, listen to me under the sound of my voice. If you're here and you've been married and remarried, I'm not talking about you. not talking about you. I'm talking about your marriage that you're in right now. Hello. What testimony will you have? My hope and desire is that you will go the distance. Whether you're on your second, or whether you're on your first, or whether you're like the woman at the well. And the person you're with, you're not even married to. Get married. Start the journey. Amen? That's good preaching. That's not even in my notes. That's free stuff right there. You're looking on your version app and going, what is he? He's off script. <laughs> Thank you, I will. But, 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 but <clears throat> last week, okay, last week, if you missed it online or you weren't here last week, we talked about something that was so completely freeing for me personally. And we talked about setting small attainable goals. We talked about the, the heartache of not being motivated. And I, and I shared with you that this year, I mean, I, I don't know if it's mental or physical or whatever it is, I'm just not motivated to lose weight this year. So instead of, of setting a goal that I'm going to work out three times a week, I've been setting small goals. I'm going to do one push-up. <laughs> Go ahead and laugh. But I am, la last night, I, I, I tell you, I overachieved, y'all. I did three. I did, I did. It's just a, it's just a God-given gift. <clears throat> no, but, but listen, because, and if you're here going, that's not, listen, what's the goal for you? Maybe with your children, you, you set a small goal. I'm, I'm just going to walk away when they make me mad. Maybe with your spouse, I'm just going to, I'm just going to say it, I love you. Maybe it's not there yet. But you set a small, achievable goal. Because what's the point of setting a 12-month goal that we can't live up to, that's unsustainable, that gets us off our path? Because the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible teaches small things is how the kingdom of heaven is. And I share with you this radical, simple point when it comes to starting these goals. To change my life, to change my life, I must change my pattern. See, for me in my, in my weight journey, my pattern was the same. Start it off, lose it fast, gain it back just as fast. And I've read and have heard from those of you that work out who've given me tons of advice, thank you so much, that that's, that, that's what always happens. It took you years to gain the weight. You need to take years to lose the weight. So we've got to change our pattern. Now, this morning, we're going to talk about something. And I want to make this simple point. To experience change in my life in any arena, it will require for you to start something or for you to stop something, or maybe even both. If you're going to be successful in being who God's called you to be, and making the change, setting a new pattern, you're going to have to start something. Or you're going to have to stop something. Or maybe even both. Now, in, in, in the weight arena of life, it's, it's both. I've got to Start working out more. Stop eating so much. In your marriage, you may have to stop doing something. You may have to start doing something. In your church life, in your, in your Christian journey, 
You may have to start doing something small. And like I shared last week, if you're not a reader and you hear the pastors always say, you know, read your Bible and pray 30 minutes every day, you know. A worn out Bible means you won't be. Those are great. But if you're not reading anything because you're just not a reader, then here's the challenge. Read one verse a day. Make your goal so stupidly small, it would be embarrassing for you to fail it. See, we all think, okay, well, let's read 30 minutes of our Bible. Man, that's hard. Time and energy and attention span. Okay, then don't start there. Start with one verse. You should be like so set free right now. There is no condemnation in this place. Amen? Amen. Now, when it comes to change, there's always a pushback. I don't know if you've ever noticed that, but there's pushback when it comes to change. I used to think as a young minister, I loved change. And so I came to this church full of changes. Amen? Amen. Brother Jerry and Judy, two of our pillars, been in this church for 30 plus years. Is that right? Something like that. And I came as the young guy and I started changing everything. Oh, you like to eat in this fellowship hall? Pfft, now it's children's room. And we won't go on all the other changes, will we? And, and so I, I used to think that I love change until change started happening to me. I do not like having to wear glasses to read. I do not like having to have robotics shoved in my ears so I can hear. Are you with me? It's called hearing aids. It's what I was... Okay, okay. everyone here? Good. But, but, but why is there pushback to the subject of change? Because we as Christians, as Christ followers, as disciples, it's all about change. It's about becoming more like Christ. Amen? Amen. Wednesday, I was talking to our teens and sharing with them our philosophy. You see it on the, on the windows, on the walls. Belong, believe, become. And one of our uh, dear teenagers said, Pastor Vince, I've been here seven years ever since you've been here. And I don't hear you talk about that very often. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good point. So let me bring it up to all of us here this morning. See, here at Journey Church, we believe we can be a place, a community that you can belong to regardless if you believe exactly like us. Because we love people. That's, that's how God operated. He sent His Son, and His Son hung out with some people that did not believe the same thing as the religious leaders. And Jesus hung out with them. But He always led them to the second step, believe. Do you believe in Christ? Have you made that commitment yet? If not, we love you, and we'd love to start a journey with you. Because ultimately, our goal is is to become like Christ. We have a saying here, come as you are, amen? amen? And leave a little bit more like Jesus. Now, let me say a couple things before we dive into my one point. Lasting permanent change happens because you've learned how to tap into God's power. This is what separates us from self-help gurus. Because we can't change ourselves, It's by the power of God that we make changes. I don't know if you've ever been frustrated like I've been frustrated, where I'm going to try my best, and I'm going to try, and I fail, and I miss it. And, and why, God? I'm trying to do, I'm trying to eat, I'm trying to... Because the Christian life is not about trying, it's about training. And when we sit underneath the Holy Spirit... He trains us through the power of God to be more like Jesus. See, apart from God, you and I can do nothing, amen? We fail miserably. Here's the second thing I want to say. <clears throat> Life is choices, not chances. Now, when I practiced that at 2 a.m., I already knew I wasn't going to get people standing up applauding me. 
So prove me wrong. Life is choices, not chances. Yeah, yeah. Bunch of phonies. <laughs> now, we, the reason why we don't really believe this is because, Pastor Vinch, you don't know what they did to me. You, you don't know how hard I worked and they gave it to someone else. If I, if I was born into that family, are you following me? Pastor Vince, you, you don't understand. My family is so dysfunctional. Well, welcome to the club. We all have dysfunctional families. I'm, I'm at least in my, in my living life and working with people, I have not met anyone that says, my family is perfect, everyone's great. <laughs> in fact, it's been quite the opposite. And if you're here this morning and you're saying, my family's perfect, we don't have any dysfunction, it's because you are the Cousin Eddie. <laughs> okay? <laughs> Just letting you know. Well, Pastor Vince, you don't know the type of abuse I dealt with. You're right, I don't. But, but see, here's the thing. Even when dealt a bad hand, God has given you the power to choose how it affects you. How will you allow it to affect you? God gives us the power of choice, which means we don't have to have a victim mindset anymore. That means you can make the choice today. Whatever happened in the past is going to stay in the past. And whatever happens in the future, we're going to push towards it and make the choice to follow the future after God's word instead of what past has taught me. Are you here this morning, church? You have that power. I'm going to read the scripture, Deuteronomy chapter 30. We're going to look at verses 15 through 18. You can look at it at your version app or on the screen. I'm going to read this from the Message Bible because I love how it says. Right before God takes his people, the nation of Israel, into the promised land, he gives them some instruction. Look at what I've done for you today, God says. I have placed in front of you life and good, death and evil. I've given you a choice. And I command to you this day, love God, your God. Walk in His ways. Keep His commandments, regulations, and rules that you will live, really live. I mean, really live. And this is where the Old Testament shadows the New Testament. Where Jesus said, I give you abundant life. Live exuberantly, blessed by God, your God, in the land that you are about to enter and possess. But I warn you, if you have not a change of heart, say that with me, change of heart. If you refuse to listen and willfully go off and serve and worship other gods. Could I bring this into the 21st century? If you choose to do life the way you want to instead of the way God wants to you, God is giving you a warning saying, listen, you need to change your heart. You will most certainly die. You won't last long in the land. This is, this is such a powerful statement we need to understand. Because God has given you and me today, 21st century Christians, a blessing to live in. Favor because of Jesus. But we won't last long with the blessing. In the land that you're crossing over to, the Jordan, to enter and possess. God is saying, in front of every challenge you and I face, there will be a choice. And you've got to make that choice. In order to be who God wants us to be, we must first decide to allow Him to change us. Here it is. The first choice in change is allowing God to have His way in your life. That's the first step. You want to take a, a, a lasting change? Then here it is. Come to grips that you're going to do life His way instead of your way. You may have heard the, the famous quote from St. Bernard. 
that said, and I believe it was like 1408, 1400s, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Boy, that, that phrase has stuck around many years, hasn't it? And so why would we today as, as Christians sitting in this room and watching online, why would we have this mindset that, that God, I, I thank you for, for saving my sins and, and washing them away, and I thank you that, that when I die I get to go to heaven, and, and, and thank you for taking care of the afterlife, I'm going to take care of everything in between. Why, why would we live with that mindset? Why would we live with good intentions? When we're not called to live by good intentions, we're called to live according to Jesus Christ. So, the first choice in change is allowing God to have His way in your life. Which means, here's the second thing, real change begins with the heart. And this is God's specialty See, if your mind, you know what you're doing is wrong, you know, but there's no change, then I would say you've not given your heart to God. Because God's specialty is changing hearts. Time and time in Scripture, we see in Deuteronomy that, that as uh, what we read, as they were getting ready to enter the Promised Land, if you back up a few chapters before that, when the children of Israel are slaves and God sends Moses to deliver them, he sends a plague, there's going to be frogs and all this stuff, and it says specifically, each time, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God is the one that softens and hardens our heart if we allow Him. And the way we allow God is we give Him our heart. And our heart is not this physical pumping of blood. It is the soulish part of us. I've said this in week one, two, and three. I've said it throughout the last seven years. I've been pastor here. I'm going to continue to say it. When you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins, instantly your spirit is made new. It's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, that you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Why do I know that off the top of my head? Because I've been teaching it to your children for four weeks. You should sign up to be part of our children's ministry. <laughs> our spirit is made new instantly. Our bodies will one day be made new. When we die, get to heaven, we're going to get a new body. The soul is in the process of being made new. Are you here this morning? It's why you and I struggle with those things that tempt us. It's why we have to constantly say, no, God, I give you my heart. And when we say we give you my heart, what we're saying is, I give you my choices, my mind. I give you my will, my desires. I give you my emotions, my energies. I'm not just going to serve you casually, but I'm going to give you everything. Now, take that same mind, will, and emotions and apply it to your marriage. Apply it to your kids. Apply it to your job. Apply it to your finances. Have you given God your mind, will, and emotions? Have you given God your choices, desires, and energies? And this brings us the real question, the real struggle. Because I think all of us in this room, if not you, I know it happens to me, that we experience real shame. We experience real guilt and frustration when we're trying. And we give God our heart, and then we take it back. It's something that, it's the misery we all wrestle with. We say to God, I give you my heart, I give you my mind, I make that choice, I'm going to give you the energy. And then it just doesn't work. We've said it, but something's fallen short. You're in good company if you struggle with this. Because the Apostle Paul says, and I'm reading this from the New Living Translation, I know that nothing good lives in me. 
It's my sinful nature. See, the soul is constantly at battle. I, I want to do what's right, but I can't. I, I want to do what's good, but I don't. I, I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. But if I, if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It's sin in me that does it. Now, Paul is not passing the blame. What he is saying to us is that there is a wrestle in us. There's something that's happening in our soul. And he says it this way, I have discovered this principle of life. That when I, when I want to do what is right, I inevitably <laughs> do what's wrong. And I love God's word. I have it in my heart. But there's another power within me that is at war with my, he uses the word mind, we would say our soul. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. Have any of you felt that way before? Thank you, all three of you. Who will free me from this life that is so dominant by sin and death? Who will free me? But well, here's the good news. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here's what Paul says that you and I have wrestled with. That despite how you feel and this turmoil that's going in within you, despite all that, God loves you. God loves you. But you don't understand. I, I failed miserably. God loves you. You don't, you, you, I, I've surrendered, but I've picked it back up. God loves you. What we fail to understand is that we have set such unrealistic goals that we want to change. I'm not going to snap at my kids anymore. I, I've made a decision. I'm, I'm not, when they set me off, I'm just not going to do it. And guess what happens? They just pushed the right button, didn't they? They cock that chin roll their eyes, whatever it is. I, I personally don't have that experience. My children are perfect. <laughs> what is it in your marriage? What is it in your finances? And we fail to remember that even in our failures, God loves us. And he has a master blueprint to your life. Philippians 6 says it this way, I am certain, St. Paul who struggles says this at the end of his life, the God who began a good work, began, is going to continue his work until it's finally finished till Christ returns. It's why even the concept of 60 months from now doesn't really work. We need to think 20 years from now, 30 years from now. Jerry and Judy, two of our elders that have been with me from the beginning will testify, I said this seven years ago. I said, I don't know where we're going as a church. Just journey with me for the next 30 years. Because as a young guy, it's easy to be so focused on mission-driven that you lose sight at the bigger picture. And God has called us as a church people in loving God and loving others. Let's just journey together and see where God takes us as we're focused on being more like Him and less like ourselves. Let's see what the next 30 years look like. Are you with me? The reason why we struggle with this is because you know your faults more than anyone else. You know your shortcomings better than anyone else. 
And, and even this morning while I'm saying to you, God loves you, you're saying, yeah, but. But you don't know what I've done. Listen, the devil is an opportunist. And when you start beating yourself down and not living in the fullness of God's love, he jumps right in and joins you. And he'll take it to extreme. And he'll put you in depression. He'll put you, you're not good enough. How could God ever love you? Yeah, if you were really... And that's when we need to say, God's not done with me. And we need to see ourselves the way God sees us. Have any of you prayed and asked God to do something and it took a while and it took a while and you thought right at the last second if it does and God showed up and did it? Why does God do that? Why doesn't He just, you know... Bless us financially so we have all of our bills paid. Why do we have to constantly spend our time on our knees asking God to show up in a big way? Because He does those things to remind us that He is God and you are not. And He does them to remind us that He still loves us. When sculptors look at a piece of rock, they see past the rock into what they envision to start carving. Michelangelo, for example, he would say, my job is to free the human form trapped inside the block. This morning, you may be here, and all you see is your life as a big block of rock. I want you to listen to my friends, the skit guys, explain exactly what I think you and I need to hear. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's workmanship, His masterpiece. I don't know about you, but when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I don't really see a, a masterpiece, you know? I mean, maybe a Picasso. It's like, <laughs> But I want to be His masterpiece. I want to be everything He created me to be. And so I go to Him in prayer and I say, Dear Heavenly Father, do whatever it takes to mold me into the image of Your Son. Make me your masterpiece. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hi. Whoa. Who are you? I'm God. You said the prayer, so here I am. You're not God. No, I am. You said the prayer. That's how it works. Okay, okay. If you're God, then uh, make it snow in here. You know what? I really don't want to make it snow in here because it'd get kind of yucky. Yeah, you're not God. Why do you say that? God wouldn't say yucky. I do. It's a Greek word. Oh. Okay, okay. Um, if you're God, what does Lamentations 15.9 say? Lamentations is only five chapters. It's a very short book. Oh. Why was it so short? I was tired of lamenting. Oh. Okay, okay. If you're God, who's going to win the World Series this year? I'm really not into playing games. Why are you so much into playing games? You are God. Well, gave it away. You answered my question with a question. I did? <sighs> yeah, I do that. Don't I? I did it again. <laughs> Step right up. Here we go. Okay. All right. Hey, what are we doing? I'm going to make you my original masterpiece. This is the process. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. Wait, wait. What are these about? These are the tools I'm going to use to make you into my original masterpiece. Okay. Yeah. Hang on. Yeah. I thought you were a carpenter. That's my son. Step right up. Here we go. Okay. Oh, hey, God. Mm -hmm. How do you know what to chisel away and what to leave? I take out everything in your life that doesn't belong there, kind of like dead weight. Ooh, speaking of dead weight, could you chisel right here? It showed up when I was in my 20s and grew around and became back fat. I don't even know why you created that, but I can't get rid of it. I mean, I've tried everything. Like, I tried running, I tried lifting weights. My wife actually talked me into trying Pilates. That was awkward, but I can't get rid of it. So if you would just chisel around here, and then, you know what, if you chisel a line right here and maybe four to five, maybe eight lines right here, that would be awesome. <laughs> You're funny. You made me that way. I also made the platypus. Oh, the platypus? All I'm saying is most of my children, when it comes to this process, they just want to talk, but they don't want to do the work. So do you want to talk or can I chisel? Talk, chisel, No, talk, no, chisel. no, 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 no. I choose to chisel. All right. Through my Holy Spirit, I'm going to bring up things in your life that I want you to work on. Okay. Like your anger. Mm. I created the emotion, but you use it in the wrong way. Um, compare yourself to others instead of me. You tell little white lies because you want to people please. You're lazy. But you try to fool everybody by looking really, really busy. 
You have a problem with lust? Well, time out. <laughs> I don't really have a problem with lust. You don't have a problem with lust. No, I can do it anytime I want. <sighs> Hang on a second. I mean, I, I got to admit, I, mean, I feel like you've been doing some great work and I'm looking pretty good right now. All right, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? I see me. Okay, then I need to keep chiseling away because ultimately you and other people need to see my son. Okay, don't misunderstand me. It's just um, when I look more like Jesus, people get uncomfortable around me. I mean, even my church friends and they're like, oh, you're holier than thou, you know? And, and I, don't, I don't think I'm supposed to make people uncomfortable. So what you're saying is you'd rather play God in certain areas of your life than for me to be God over your whole life. That is not what I said. It's what you meant. Yes, it is. Um, it's hard to talk to you. You know everything that I'm thinking. I'm just saying you've done some great work. Maybe we take a break, a sabbatical from each other, you know. I'll stay right here and then, you That's know. That's just it. You never just stay right there. You're either moving toward me or away from me, but never you just stay. What you're doing is called control. Do you want to control things in your life or can I chisel? Control, chisel, control, no, chisel. No, chisel, chisel. All right. But can we chisel where I want? That's called control. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Now this right here, this secret sin that you keep running to whenever you're hurting, angry, lonely, tired, that you think you're fooling everybody, but it's making you a whitewashed tomb. Are you ready for me to chisel this out of your life? Yeah. See, it's a process. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's your whole life. And you care so deeply about what other people think of you. It's rubbish. It's garbage. The greatest thing you're ever going to hear is at the end of your life when you hear me say, well done, good and faithful servant. That's what you keep your eye on. That's the prize. Heavenward. <coughs> oh, that hurts. Oh, trust me. This hurts me more than it hurts you. Right. <coughs> okay. I'm sorry. I just, I don't think you understand this pain. Pardon me? You're asking me to sacrifice a lot, God. Don't. Talk to me about sacrifice. I know all about sacrifice. I sent my son to die on the cross for pain, for sin, but I also did it for another reason, to give you freedom. Do you know what insanity is? Insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. And there are things that you've been doing for years, these empty wells that don't have anything to offer. You've been going to them and it's insane. Allow me to chisel them out of your life. Um, allow me to produce character where you keep focusing so much on your image. Okay, but I was thinking. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. Okay, but if we went another way. Your ways are not oh, my ways. I can't. You can't what? I, I, I can't be good. That's your excuse. That's your excuse is that you can't be good. It's not an excuse. I can't. Oh, my child. In the beginning. I said it was good. I made you good. Be good. Yeah, but you and I both... What? Nothing. No, what is it? Nothing, okay? You wouldn't understand. I, God of all the universe, wouldn't understand something one of my children has to say. Try me. It's just, um... I let you down so many times, God. No, my child. You were never holding me up. I hold you up with my victorious, righteous right hand. Never the other way around. In this relationship, I hold you up. Okay. And chisel away. But just, just be prepared for what you're going to find in there. Because I know who's inside there. Because I get up every morning and I look at him in the mirror, and I hate who I see. Because deep inside there, this, this, this little kid who gets up every morning and dresses like an adult, and I go out and I, and I try to do what I'm supposed to do, but I can't, okay? I can't be who everybody else expects me to be. God, I can't even be who I wanna be, much less who you created me to be. And so inside is this scared, stupid little kid. But you chisel away, just, be prepared. You have listened to so many voices for far too long that were not for me. And you have totally bought into the lie, haven't you? You think you're junk, don't you? When you lay your head down at night after you've done the dance to get the hug, you think you're junk. Listen to me. 
I don't take time to make junk. How can I show you that my love for you stretches as far as the east to the west? That How can I show you that my love for you has no end? I know, reach in your back pocket. What? Reach in your back pocket. Why? Are you arguing with me? Reach in your back pocket. Oh, God. Yes? I just meant, God, I'll do that right now. You're just saying my name in vain. Come on, it's, it's a name, it's a saying. It's a name above all names. It's more than a saying, it's more than a name. I want to teach you something about my name. Reach in your back pocket. Oh my gosh. You know what that is? Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a note. I, I wrote it when I was in college. How did you get this? Hello? Oh yeah. Go ahead, read it. I love Angie. Other side. Sorry. Dear God, did I hear you right today? Did I hear you say that you love me? Even though you and I both know I've messed up so many times. Did I hear you say you want to use me? And I feel so useless. If you'll take me and use me, then God, I give you all that I am. Take me. I love you, God. I love you too. And I love you too much just to leave you where you're at. This salvation that you hold, I don't want it to be some sentimental gush or some head knowledge. I want you to work it out in every detail of your life. And when problems come and chaos happens, don't look at it as a, as a prison, but look at it as a father disciplines his child. A father disciplines the ones he loves. I know, but it's going to be tough. Yes, but you bought into the lie thinking everything was going to be easy when you gave everything over to me. There will be trouble in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. I want you to do something. I want you to look out there and I want you to say, Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Tommy is God's... No, not the way you see yourself or you try so desperately for others to see you, but maybe for the first time in your life, the way I see you, the way I created you. Tommy is God's original masterpiece. Yes, you are. And so are you. God doesn't make junk. You are an original masterpiece. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, From then on, Jesus began to tell people, Turn to God and change the way you think and act, because the kingdom of heaven is near. So I'm going to ask you this morning the last question. And we're going to do something this morning. I want to open up these, this altar. Not every week do I ask for us to come down to the front, but in prayer this morning, I felt like the Holy Spirit said, I want my church, the ones I love, to have an opportunity to make that confession. So here's the question. Will you make the choice to give God the time needed, the time needed to chisel your life into the image of Christ. They said it so well, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. And for some of us this morning, it's going to take longer than 12 months, 60 months, 120 months. Are you listening? I don't know how long it's going to take. 
I don't know how long. I gave my life to Christ when I was nine years old. And I'm still on the journey. And if you ask me, I'm, I'm nowhere close where I need to be to look like Jesus. I know my failures better than anyone else. And believe me, there have been a lot of people to point them out. But I know them better than anyone else. But I've got to make the choice each day. God, I'm going to give you time to chisel. God, I'm going to give you time to mold me and to cut out the parts that do not look like you. So all across this building, I'm going to ask if you would stand to your feet. And I'm going to ask if you will join me at the altar. I'm going to be the first one down. But you would say, yes, Pastor Vince. I'm going to make a confession. They're already coming. You don't have to wait. You can come on down. I'm going to give God the time that's needed to chisel my life into the image of Christ. Thank you for joining us at Journey Church. Our hope is that these messages challenge your soul, equip your spirit, and give you a hope for your future.